there. I'm Jim Zyron. Welcome back for more conversations. Have we arrived at the twilight of American democracy? Kurt Anderson seems to think maybe. He's written a brilliant new book entitled Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, A Recent History. In the book, he sounds the alarm about inequities and inequalities in American society that he perceives and offers a prescription for what we might do in the future. Kurt Anderson, welcome back to the program. Happy to be back, Jim. Now, first, opening question, Evil Geniuses, what an intriguing title. Uh, who were the geniuses and why are they evil? Well, it, it didn't begin with the title. Often I do begin books with a title. This one I didn't come up with until I was done with it. Milton Friedman, who 50 years ago, practically this week, uh, wrote uh, a big uh, splashy article in the New York Times Magazine that they titled The Friedman Doctrine. And, and when it came at really the height of the late 60s, early 70s, at this great last sort of uh, high tide of progressivism in the political economy in, these, in this country, he, Milton Friedman, called for this return to the way it was before the New Deal. You know, he, he really wanted to turn back the clock of economic progress that we'd had so successfully, so prosperously in this country as things were becoming more and more equal and fair. And, as, they and on, as they said on Archie Bunker, the good old days. Well, exactly. And, and Archie Bunker, no uh, coincidence, uh, was, was about to premiere on television at that time um, and, and, and became the most popular show on television. So that's, he, he was one of them saying, oh no, this whole, this, these last several decades of great prosperity and increasing equality were a big mistake, a big wrong turn. And so, and, and during the 70s uh, afterwards, um, the, these various people, Charles Koch being among the most famous, other uh, libertarian uh, zealots of the economic right uh, along with him, the CEOs of the largest corporations got together in the, in the early 70s and created a new kind of Politburo called the Business Roundtable. They all got together, not so much saying, oh, we know where we're going, we're, gonna, we're going to hijack the economy and, 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 and take it where we want it, Rather, I, I believe, and the story I tell in Evil Geniuses is that they were so freaked out by, by EPA, OSHA, all these, all these regulatory uh, oversights that were suddenly being laid upon them and the, the general public sentiment against big corporate power that, that was scaring them. And so they got together and, and started a long game um, that was more successful than they could have imagined. Now, Friedman was an economist at the University of Chicago, and uh, he wrote a, a number of, uh, uh, of books and, and articles in which he talked about uh, the importance of uh, shareholder value, and that shareholder value reigned supreme. So that was more important than any obligation of the corporation to right. improve society or improve uh, the lot of Americans. And uh, that kind of was standard was picked up by these others. You mentioned uh, Koch and Richard Mellon Scaife and, um, uh, the, um, and John Olin, who was a gun manufacturer. Uh, and uh, they transformed what you call the political economy. What was the political economy? Well, the, I, I distinguish between the economy and what I was trying to be taught by some of my professors in college, the political economy. We think of the economy, uh, you know, the economy is, oh, how, do, how is unemployment today? How is inflation today? How, how, how is economic growth today? Those are all important things, but, but, they, but I, I say, I use the phrase political economy because it's the, it's the larger system uh, of, of, that is made up of laws and regulations and tax codes and all the rest that decide how the pie is shared, right? And, and so that's why I call it the political economy and that's what they were doing. They were, they were, you know, we had a prosperous economy, an incredibly prosperous economy for several decades when, when these right-wingers came along to change the political economy, which is, oh, prosperity is all well and good, but we want more wealth for our wealthy selves. We want more 
power for our powerful corporation. So that's what that's what that's what really changed. And and yeah, shareholder value. I mean, th this is part of the story, which is that uh, certainly since the Great Depression and with the New Deal, um, uh, there had been an expectation and a set of norms as well as laws and regulations, but norms that uh, corporations had a responsibility, yes, of course, to profit, yes, of course, to shareholders, but beyond that, to, to their communities, to society at large. Um, and, and, and what Milton Friedman and the, the kind of what were then far right libertarians and are now mainstream uh, were arguing is that no, they had no obligation beyond maximizing their profits absolutely and, and completely to the, to the exclusion of all other values that we Americans uh, believe in. So that's really what happened. And, and that was the change around 1980 that took them a decade to succeed and they did. And, 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 and it really, the, those market values, those profit values above all became what, what became the American way uh, to, to a degree that wasn't true in the, all the rest of the free market world in, in Europe, in Canada, in Australia. We became this outlier uh, compared to all of our rich world peers. Uh, now, we have the situation today where we have enormous economic and income disparity. I mean, it's been said by some that 1% uh, of the population uh, is, possesses 99% uh, of the wealth of the country uh, and leaves the others uh, far behind, the, the mega billionaires. Uh, now, have they been created by uh, uh, these evil geniuses who uh, changed our tax policy and uh, and, and really changed our entire emphasis on uh, shareholder value. Right. And, and, and again, there's, the, there's nothing wrong, in my view, with billionaires. Uh, you know, and by the way, the United States, as a per, on a per capita basis, doesn't even have the most billionaires. Who has more billionaires? Well, countries, much fairer countries like Sweden and Norway and Denmark. They're, they have plenty of billionaires, as I say, more than we do, but they tax them in a way along with other well-to-do people who aren't billionaires, to create a system that is fair and secure for all, all citizens rather than just the richest. So that's the difference. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, there have always been very rich people and, 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 and fine in our free market economy, but they need to pay their fair share that they're able to so that the, the rest, the 80% of American citizens who are living, if not hand to mouth, with great insecurity, uh, have a chance to to rise, to feel secure, to feel content, and to get their fair share of the pie. So, so I don't focus so much on billionaires. Although, in, when we have a system that is so unfair, the grotesque, the the the, the fact that our six hundred billionaires have become just, for instance, in the last six months of this pandemic, so much, so many billions richer, while while the rest of their fellow citizens are as insecure and more insecure as ever is, is a grotesque disparity. So, I, I, you know, my focus in this book and in general is not so much on, oh, the billionaires are terrible. The billionaires are terrible if they can have so much political power that they have accumulated over the last 40 or 50 years that they didn't used to have. So that, that's the problem. It's not, not richness and wealth per se, it is untaxed wealth and wealth that becomes the means to political power, which is an oligarchy or a plutocracy. Well, you mentioned the um, $64 word, which is tax. Uh, yeah. And somewhere around the late 70s, early 80s, you have uh, Grover Norquist uh, opposing any increase in taxes and particularly taxes on the wealthy. And um, over time, uh, tax policy changed. Uh, perhaps you could um, speak to that. Yeah, I mean, Gruber Norquist is definitely one of the evil geniuses. I devote half a chapter to him. Um, he started uh, uh, Americans for Tax Reform, which w is has been and remains this incredibly uh, influential and important uh, institutionalization of what became the Republican idea, right? Uh, which is to say, no, you know, Taxes, all taxes are bad. Our whole, our entire mission is keeping taxes low. 
for the rich, for large corporations. Gruber Norquist created this, this, this pledge in the late 80s um, that uh, basically required all Republicans running certainly for Congress or the House or the Senate or, or president to say, no, I will not, I will not increase taxes, period, end of story, which is a, an absurd way to try to govern a country. But, but it, it represented what, ha, what was then becoming and has since, thanks to Grover Norquist and others, become the only, the, truly the only idea <laughs> of, of the Republicans, which is taxes, bad, taxes, bad. Now, along with that is government regulation is bad, but, but, but really taxes are bad. Because, of course, if you lower taxes and do so by means of increasing debts and deficit wildly, you know, you can you can bring along some people. So yeah, I like lower taxes. Who likes ta who likes high taxes? But for the evil geniuses, for the billionaires, for the rich people, it is really about their taxes being low because they are the ones who monstrously benefit from that. And, and again, the same the same kind of trick happens with the stock market. Oh, the stock market's doing great. The stock market's still in the pandemic doing great. Well, and. Yes, half of Americans own some stocks in their retirement funds and so forth. But I, I just, every time people say, oh, but the stock market is important for everyone. Well, it's important for half the people who own some stocks, sure. And there are tens of thousands of dollars in stocks that they might have in their, in their retirement funds. But this is the fact. 10% of Americans own 84% of the stocks. Just like 10% of Americans get 84% of the benefits of tax cuts. So that's, that's the thing, you know, I mean, I, I, I am not, nor should we be pro-tax per se, but the, 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 the tax system that makes sense is the one that allows us to do what we need to do and share the economic pie for, for the majority of Americans rather than just 1% or 10% or 20%. Now, you don't blame uh, the situation uh, solely on Donald Trump because you go back to the late 1970s or early 1980s when it all starts. Uh, but uh, can you also, uh, if you're um, dealing out blame, blame the liberals, the Democrats in Congress uh, for going along with unfair tax policies? With, I mean, Senator Schumer is a great apostle of the uh, carried interest which uh, has no rationale except to benefit billionaires. Well, it's unfortunate. Uh, I mean, there's a history, as, just as you say, and I, I track that history, the, the uh, liberal democratic complicity in this process. And I, and I, and I recurringly uh, blame myself, not that I was a maker of policy, but I was, you know, uh, as a journalist, as a writer, uh, as whatever I've been, I, as a citizen, as a I, voter. Sure. I, 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 I call myself a, a liberal useful idiot to these to these to this kind of right wing hijacking of our economy. Uh, and, and, and definitely. And, and people say, oh, it was Bill Clinton. Well, yes, but it was before even Bill Clinton during the 1970s. Again, the new Democrats, the Gary Hart's, the the Bill Bradley's, the the Paul Songus's, all the the stars of, of Democratic politics from the 70s on, all of, the, all of whom ran for president, were this kind of new Democrat who said, oh, no, no, we're not really so different from Republicans on economics. Uh, you know, and, 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 and the, we must compromise, we must compromise. Well, they compromised with the right as the right kept moving further and further and further right to the point where by the 1990s, certainly, there was no real difference politically economically between Democrats and Republicans, which is why, among other reasons, that lots of working class white Americans abandoned the Democratic Party. What, what are the Democrats going to do for me that's different than Republicans? Nothing. At least the Republicans hate the same people I hate, so I'm going to vote for them. So th that's what happened. And, 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 and really, until the last decade, uh, there has been just so, so little difference on economics, as opposed to all the various cultural touch points and, and race and reproductive rights and, and gender equality and all the rest. But on economics, there hasn't been much difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. Unfortunately, there has not been a real opposition party, a, 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 an economic left in the, anywhere in the vicinity of power until very recently. Well, you uh, 
touched on the social issues of race, gender, uh, marriage equality, I guess, uh, would be included. Um, and um, the uh, Democrats did uh, part company, abortion, I guess, would part company sure. with, with the Republicans on, on those issues. But was this really a ploy of the evil geniuses so that uh, they'd get everybody focused on the Democratic side on these social issues and they would ignore the real goal, uh, which was uh, not to share the wealth, but to uh, aggregate the wealth in the hands of a few people. I, I you know, uh, it was part of their, was it part of their strategy? Absolutely. Which isn't to say that those issues aren't important issues to have spent political capital on. God knows they're crucial issues, but um, yeah, it, 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 served the interests of, of, the, of the very, very rational people, mostly men, uh, in charge, my evil geniuses, to, um, as a way to, to build their own political coalition. I mean, I, you know, I, does Charles Koch uh, want to uh, make abortion illegal? No. And, and and does that does that donor class want to make abortion criminalized or 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 discriminate against gay people? Mostly, no, not. But but if if their their strange bedfellows in their in their right wing coalition, if those are the issues that appeal to them, like go for it, we we'll get our. That's the means to to increasing our wealth and power. Well, one of the uh, uh, I guess two breaks on uh, what they sought to accomplish. Uh, the first was before Citizens United, we had some regulation of campaign finance and, and large contributions. Now we have unlimited contributions through PAC, uh, PACs, uh, uh, which is the Citizens United case, and the other, the antitrust laws. And you deal with that in your book. So uh, what What's happened to the antitrust laws? I thought they were a wonderful way of uh, stopping concentration of wealth and economic power. Well, it, exactly. And, and by the way, we in America, in the, starting in the 1890s, invented them. Suddenly this new thing, the large corporation that was rapidly monopolizing industries like oil or tobacco or whatever, we, 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 we Americans got together and said, no, no, no. This, we, we have to figure out a way to, to control this, to maintain, we're a free market economy. We need to maintain competition. We're not anti-capitalist. Was was the was the idea behind antitrust? But we have to set up guardrails and regulations so that the, so that it's the system works optimally. And that was that was an absolutely bipartisan uh, agreement through the 1950s and 60s and 70s. You know. Uh, I, I, I came across this Dwight Eisenhower as he was leaving after two terms in office in the 1950s was, was bragging about how strong an antitrust enforcer the Eisenhower administration had been. So this was not some lefty thing. It was, it was the consensus. And then, but there had been this University of Chicago, Milton Friedmanite, Robert Bork uh, cohort of people during the 60s and 70s writing and writing and, 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 and maneuvering to change the way people, the, the law and the judiciary would think about antitrust. And they succeeded. <laughs> and, and, it, and I didn't realize until I did the research for Evil Geniuses, I knew about Robert Bork, of course. The, the, he the, was the guy who was appointed, he was the guy who was appointed to the Supreme Court and right. uh, I guess by Reagan and uh, he right. failed of confirmation because his views his right-wing views were off the wall. The Senate wouldn't uh, go along well, with it. Well, and interestingly, he, he was, uh, yes, exactly. And his, it was especially his, his arguments 20 years earlier against the Civil Rights Act saying, no, no, every restaurateur, if he's a racist, has a right to exclude black people. So that, that is the thing that really got him dinged in 1987. Well, it was gender, not, he however, said, as he te I remember he testified before the Senate that uh, the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, didn't protect women. It only protected blacks because that was the original understanding. Correct. And, and no one has and interpreted the, it that way since. No, exactly. And when and when you, when when they dredged up the article that he wrote in 1963, saying how horrible and dreadful the Civil Rights Act would be because of its violation of economic freedom, that pretty much did him in. However, in, before, you know, on his way to that moment of becoming famous for being rejected as a Supreme Court justice, 
1978, he published a book called The Antitrust Paradox. Now, he had, that had been his specialty, antitrust, which is to say anti-antitrust. Let's not do this anymore. He published this book that had more influence, I would say, in our economy than any single book since Adam Smith, practically. It changed the way lawyers and the law and, and, and the, the you know, corporate legal establishment thought about antitrust. It was quoted in a Supreme Court decision a year after it came out, and it, 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 it really changed and, and eviscerated and emasculated how, how we use antitrust to, to fight monopoly economic power and political power in this country. Well, have we had a significant monopolization case uh, really since Standard Oil way back when? I mean, well, we had uh, Microsoft, but then the government caved and- uh, Yeah, uh, no, and exactly. I mean, Microsoft, U.S. versus Microsoft back in the end of the 90s was the last epic one. It did have a good effect, even though the Bush administration came in and caved, as you say. But it did have the effect, at least at that moment, of scaring Microsoft off from, and from, from monopolizing the new Internet, right, which was just emerging. And therefore, Google was able to which had just been invented, just come along, was able to grow. Facebook, which was about to come along, was able, because Microsoft was, was tamped down by that antitrust case, was able to grow. And as soon as that happened, because antitrust enforcement was, that was the last hurrah, those companies, Google, Facebook especially, are now monopolies unlike we've had since Standard Oil in the 1890s. Yes. So, uh... Did you intend your book as a, uh, a warning or a dire prediction of things to come? Or do you see any uh, light at the end of the tunnel? Well, uh, all of the above. Uh, I, I, I didn't really, uh, you know, I had seen this, I had hunches about it, but I, I couldn't find a book that, that was a, a, a sort of, you know, easily digestible history of what the heck happened since I was a young man and became between youth and middle age. How did this happen? And so, so I wanted to find that out. Um, and 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 uh, so uh, and and just how how rigged the system had indeed become. Um, uh, so, is there light at the end of the tunnel? I think so. For there is. I mean, unlike my previous book, which we talked about last time, I was here, Fantasyland, which is really. The problem of that of magical thinking and our 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 American weakness for exciting falsehoods, that's harder to fix. You know that that is what it is, and it's gotten worse. But that's harder to fix. This 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 systemic inequality and systemic insecurity, um, systemic immobility. You can't. It's harder to rise now than it ever has been in this country. We are rapidly running out of time, but I wanted to ask you about COVID. I mean, COVID is a reality, but it's also a symbol of uh, what the evil geniuses have done and, um, and the disparity that exists. Why don't you just talk for a moment Totally. Well, I, I, I had the good fortune, I guess, of, 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 of turning in this book in February. So I had, and it, with, and it said, last chapter to come when I turned in the manuscript. Well, I had February and March and April and May to write the last chapter focused on COVID and how the response, this, this administration's response to COVID and the political rights, the economic rights response to COVID is like a perfect case study that all that matters and what really matters is the stock market staying high, regulations staying low, business profits remaining high, to hell with public health and 200,000 people dying. I mean, that's that's a that's just true, and 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 I and I use the the our experience of COVID and and certainly this administration's and and the right wing establishment's response to COVID as as illustrations of 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 this horrible place and horrible set of values and priorities that we plus fantasy land. No one has to wear a mask. Well, exactly, and 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 again, that's how it's exactly how how these two books speak to each other. Nobody has to wear a mask. Well, and that may serve the feeling of liberty of some dude doing cosplay with his automatic weapons, but who, do, who does it really serve? It serves the people who want, who, who, who are in charge of, of the economy and who would rather make sure that their, their, their st 
stock shares uh, stay at, at these dizzyingly high prices rather than at the expense of another 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 uh, deaths of citizens. Kurt Anderson, I have a question for you because yes, we, we've come to the end of our time. And uh, the question is, how can we undo the evil that's been accomplished by the evil geniuses? Uh, well, as long as it is not the twilight, it, it may be the twilight of democracy, but we still have a democracy. We still have elections and, and we have to do what they did, elect the right people and keep our eye on the ball for the long game. It's not just this election or the next election, it's every election and it's having a distinct vision of what we could be and what we should be and what we can be and what to some degree in economics we were and, and bring that back. We mean it this time. So, Kurt Anderson, this has just been marvelous. And thank you for coming by. And thank you for coming by. And tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Be well, stay safe, and all the best.